Welcome to AP US History. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Michael Gillette, Champion High School. Um, our topic now is the New South. It's one of our six uh, Gilded Age uh, units uh, that make up the, uh, the Gilded Age time period, uh, 1865 to 1900. So the New South, uh, the term, the expression uh, New South uh, actually is derived from a speech that was delivered on December 21st, 1886 by a, by a then 36-year-old editor of the Atlanta Constitution and Journal um, by the name of Henry W. Grady uh, in New York City. Uh, in that speech, uh, Grady set forth a vision uh, for the South that inspired a generation of Southerners to follow. Uh, in that speech, he says, quote, the old South rested everything on slavery and agriculture, unconscious that these could neither give nor maintain healthy growth. The new South prevent, presents a perfect democracy, the oligarchs leading in the popular movement, a social system compact and closely knitted, less splendid on the surface, but stronger at the core, a hundred farms for every plantation, 50 homes for every palace, and a diversified industry that meets the complex need of this complex age. So I think when we look at this quote, there's a, there's a lot here that we have to unpack. Um, you know, I think first of all, um, talking about the old South. The old South is obviously if there's a, a new South and there's gonna be an old South. The old South is the South that existed prior to, um, prior to the Civil War, all right? It's the antebellum South. It was a South that um, essentially put all their eggs in plantation agriculture, namely uh, King Cotton, uh, King Cotton. So part of Henry W. Grady's New South Creed is this recognition that um, perhaps that was one of the inherent flaws of the Old South, is that it lacked, as you see down here, a diversified economy. Um, that as the United States moves into a more, uh, into a complex age, you know, as we, as we move into a modern age, Grady acknowledges that Southerners need to embrace change, that Southerners need to embrace modernity, that, that, that uh, in, in, in many cases, that uh, the South needs to embrace modernization, to modernize their economy, uh, to become less aristocratic. He says it here uh, where he talks about a social system, compact and closely knitted, less splendid on the surface, but stronger at the core, a hundred farms for every plantation. So essentially to, uh, to bring about a greater degree of equality amongst uh, Southerners, uh, to dismantle in a way uh, the aristocratic features of, you know, the old South, the old, you know, that was uh, tied to the old peculiar institution of the South and, the, and, and what, what we had um, leading up to the war, um, leading up to the war. Uh, he goes on to acknowledge that it was the failures of the Cotton Kingdom and its unwillingness to industrialize, that that's ultimately what cost the South the war. Um, and so he, he represented an acknowledgement of the failures of Cotton Kingdom and a willingness to direct um, capital towards uh, industrialization. Uh, he also promoted the importance of a more widespread education system um, to address the problems of illiteracy and to promote skills amongst the Southern workforce. So if the, if, if the South, if the new South, if this post-Civil War South acknowledges that it needs to become more modern, it needs to become more diverse, that it needs to, in, in many cases, uh, mimic the North and, and, and copy their, their economy, then they need a workforce that is both literate, educated, and, and, and a workforce that has skills. Uh, we need skilled labor. So, um, so what part of the New South Creed is this 
uh, embracing the, the importance of modernizing uh, the South and, and really bringing to uh, the Southern people uh, a better education system and vocational training of, of potential industrial workers. And then lastly, he concluded that the Southern people understand, I think this is big, you know, that, that he acknowledges that, you know, uh, that the Southern people understand that the importance of peace uh, now that the war is over, that sectional peace is something that uh, Southerners are definitely committed to, and that racial harmony would help to contribute to a more stable South and a more stable environment uh, for economic growth. So obviously this bullet down here at the bottom, it, it's a lie. I mean, it's a lie. Um, if, the, if the South is going to um, if the South is going to modernize, um, then it needs, you know, they, they acknowledge that racial harmony is, is, is a predicate for it. Okay. Um, but the fact is we don't ever have racial harmony. Uh, they don't promote racial harmony. And, um, and, and, and though there is sectional peace, um, you know, trying to resolve the, the racial problem. It's going to be a problem that the South is going to continue to have. And in some cases, still still, um, still has that same problem. Um, so that being said, uh, let's move on. So the New South Creed, again, uh, Grady pointed to the North as a model for economic success that the South must follow. You know, in reality, the South would remain largely agrarian and rural. Grady's promise to racial harmony was hollowed out by stringent Jim Crow laws, voting restrictions, and racial violence. And the New South's commitment to education resulted in poorly funded schools that failed to produce a labor force necessary for an industrial economy. So I, I think when we're learning about the New South and that motto, that creed, you know, you think about the goals that are that are laid out by Grady, uh, and, and I don't think you can dismiss. Uh, the, the degree to which Southern elites really bought into Grady's vision. Okay, so, so as, you're, as you're learning this material, understand that this, this New South Creed is really something that um, Southern elites after the war really buy into, right? However, they, they don't do a very, they're not very effective in carrying out those goals. In fact, um, despite their devotion to the New South, uh, the, their, this idea of a New South, <clears throat> the reality is that the South is going to continue to remain largely agricultural, largely rural, and, and very, very much behind um, the economic development in the North, okay? Um, students have often, you know, asked, you know, at what point do you start to see the new South or the South in general, the Southern states, you know, the old Confederacy. At what point do you start to see the old Confederacy um, begin to catch up with the North in terms of economic development? And it's really not until the 1950s. Um, during the 1950s, uh, we really see a significant development of what was called the Sun Belt. And, um, and, and really what, what led to it was the Cold War. Uh, the Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union, um, it, it helped to foster new um, defense industries, um, defense plants, shipyards, um, high tech. You know, uh, for example, Houston, Texas uh, became Space City USA um, for the, uh, the space race, um, NASA. So it really wasn't until the Cold War in the 1950s that you really start to see significant development of the, of the South, uh, modernization of the Southern economy. So it's going to remain for many, many decades um, very much behind uh, the rest of the country. So, um, so the New South campaign was championed by Southern elites, often outside of the old planter class, in hopes of making a fresh new start forming partnerships with Northern capitalists in order to modernize and to speed up the economic development of the South. The rise of the New South also involved the continued supremacy of whites over blacks. So a big, a big part of the story 
of the new south is the the fact is that the south when it comes to race relations when it comes to the status of the newly freed slaves um very little improves for african americans and so um the civil war though it extinguished the confederacy it did not ex extinguish white supremacy so um so regardless of the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments throughout the New South and, and really on into the 20th century, uh, African Americans are going to have very little or no uh, political power. Um, Grady stated, if you look at this last bullet, Grady stated in the 1888 speech about the, old, the New South, quote, the supremacy of the white race of the South must be maintained forever. And the domination of the Negro race resisted at all points and all hazards because the white race is the superior race. This declaration shall run forever with the blood that feeds Anglo-Saxon hearts. So there you go, uh, straight from the horse's mouth himself. Okay, so, all right. So let's go back, I missed one. Um, no, here we go. So the first area you wanna look at is attempts in the South to industrialize. Um, as you, if you go back to Henry W. Grady's New South Creed, you know, that there is this desire to want to copy and to emulate uh, the success going on in the North. And there was, um, to a certain degree, some success uh, with industrialization after the Civil War in the South. The first area would be the textiles. Uh, by 1920s, the Southern textile industry will overtake New England. Uh, between 1880 and 1900, the number of cotton mills in the South grew from 161 to 400 mills. The number of textile workers grew fivefold during that period, and the consumption of cotton. You know, remember the cotton kingdom was supposed to be in, in many ways degraded or down, downgraded, but consumption of cotton grew from 182,000 bales to almost 1.5 million bells from 1880 to 1900. So it's interesting that even after the war, the only thing the South produced that was really wanted, uh, where there was a, a definite uh, demand, um, was cotton. So much cotton that they had to import food <laughs> during the period. So you can see I uh, uh, impl included some statistics here um, you know, from 1860, which of course is the, uh, the election of Abraham Lincoln. So when Abraham Lincoln was elected, um, there was 7 million acres of cotton cultivation of acres of cotton being cultivated. And by 1940, um, that number nearly right, ri rises sixfold, um, to 44 million acres. So cotton isn't going away. And in fact, during the period, it is expanding tremendously. Another industry that thrived during the New South during the post Civil War era is tobacco. Uh, tobacco benefited from uh, an introduction of a new variety, uh, two new varieties, uh, Burley tobacco, and probably the most important would be Brightleaf. The Brightleaf tobacco brand uh, variety was very, very popular. Uh, just like we had in the North, uh, we're going to see major uh, tycoons, uh, monopolies, millionaires, uh, tobacco is going to promote uh, two very important men uh, who are going to dominate the industry. The first is John Ruffin Green, um, who led a company out of North Carolina called Bull Durham, um, the Bull Durham brand, uh, and he was a pioneer of that bright leaf, uh, uh, that bright green leaf tobacco. Um, this is a guy who essentially started with just um, uh, a couple hundred acres of land um, to grow tobacco uh, to eventually build one of the largest tobacco companies in the world. Uh, there's, a, there's a story of Mark Twain, just to show you how big Bull Durham was. Uh, there's a story of Mark Twain who traveled to Egypt because, you know, he had always wanted to see the pyramids. And uh, Mark Twain wrote that um, he was very discouraged because it seemed as though every view he had of the pyramids was obscured by a Bull Durham sign. 
you know, an advertisement sign. So I think that story kind of gives us a pretty good idea that Bull Durham tobacco isn't just uh, extremely popular uh, in the United States, but also around the world, including the Valley of the Kings um, in Egypt. So it's a uh, it's a pretty far reaching uh, company um, that had a pretty big uh, market share at the time. Um, the big name we know of, however, within the tobacco industry, as uh, the founder of the American Tobacco Company, it's the Duke family. Okay, the Duke family. Uh, the Dukes are going to um, beginning in 1872, are going to produce roughly 172,000 tons annually. Uh, they're very successful uh, in large part uh, due to their advertising efforts, uh, their marketing campaigns. Uh, by 1904, uh, the American Tobacco Company had control of 75% of the total tobacco production in the United States. And so uh, I think it's important to note that um, globally, um, almost 90% of the tobacco that was consumed, uh, around the world in the global market was produced by American companies. And there's no company that was larger than the American tobacco company. Eventually, um, by 1911, um, because of the Sherman antitrust act, uh, with the Sherman antitrust act, American tobacco company is going to be trust busted in the smaller companies in order to promote uh, competition. So, so obviously if you look at those names, if you look at Bull Durham and you look at Duke, um, if you're kind of halfway paying attention it, and if you know your universities really well, you know, the Duke family founded Duke University and uh, they, um, Duke is located on what's called Tobacco Row. Um, Tobacco Road, uh, there's actually three universities that are within about 30 miles of each other. Um, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, Wake Forest University, and of course, Duke University. So, so really, you'd have to say that in North Carolina, uh, the tobacco industry did bring, uh, did lead to a, a tremendous amount of development. Did lead to a lot of economic development in that particular area. So since we're talking about Bull Durham, this is obviously, if you know anything about me, I'm a huge baseball fan. Uh, I used to teach a baseball class, so I found this classic scene from Bull Durham. I had to find a, a clip that um, didn't have any cussing in it. So, um, so you just ignore, just uh, kind of, you know, humor me. Whoops. A little technical difficulties here. We'll get back online. Yep. It was 
dig in there if I was you. That's what might meet your head. I don't know where it's gonna go. Swear to God. <laughs> all right anyway you know me it's so obviously it's a it's a movie set in durham north carolina and it's got a minor league uh baseball team called the durham bulls and uh, so anyway it's one of my favorites so anyway so talking about economic growth other industries you got the coal iron and limestone production in various areas of the south largely limited to the southern appalachians but also prevalent in alabama uh, coal production in the South grew from 4.6 million tons produced in 1875 to 49.3 uh, million tons in 1900. So that's pretty steady growth. Um, Birmingham, Alabama. Now, Alabama, every year, Alabama and Auburn University, they play for what's called the, they play in what's called the Iron Bowl. Uh, and if you ever wondered why they call that rivalry game the Iron Bowl, um, it's because Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, was considered to be the iron capital of the South. Um, in fact, it was nicknamed the Pittsburgh of the South. And so I, I found actually, I found a picture here of miners uh, from Birmingham. Um, the big reason, by the way, and I know many of you have read uh, in your English class a um, letter from a uh, uh, Birmingham jail, Dr. Martin Luther King. And one of the, in addition to the, the amount of segregation uh, that they had in Birmingham and and despite the fact that it was a, a perfect place for King to go because of Bull Connor and the local government and, and how um, loose they were and in the use of the police against uh, protesters. And another reason King likes to go to Birmingham is because it is a, um, it's kind of an economic capital of Alabama. I mean, it's, it's, it's a place where African Americans were being routinely discriminated against in the mines and, um, yeah, discriminated against in the mines and, and in those, in those iron foundries. So, so yeah, then you have your timber industry, um, with economic growth in the South. Uh, came the need for housing. Uh, this helped spur the timber industry. Lumber camps, little mills sprouted all across the mountains and flatlands. And by 1900, timber is going to outgross textiles in profits. Uh, and there were other diversified industries throughout the um, throughout the South. Um, fertilizer production, oysters, vegetables, fruits, shipbuilding. I, I actually included a picture here. It's not a very good picture. I'm now learning, <laughs> but this is Norfolk, Virginia. And Norfolk was known for its, and it still is known as one of the largest shipyards in the United States. So that, the United States Navy has a huge shipyard there. Uh, wagon, the building of wagons and buggies, making alcohol. Um, of course, you get into the bootleggers and, and the, and uh, the Southerners that made whiskey, moonshine, and, and other spirits. Um, paper, glass, clay, and stone products were also made in various areas of the South. So there is this willingness to uh, industrialize in the South, but, but for the most part, it's going to lag behind. Uh, at the turn of the century, most of the South is going to remain largely undeveloped. Um, and despite the optimistic rhetoric of the New South spokesman, the typical Southerner was less apt to be tending a loom or forge. Um, as the saying went, facing the eastern end of a West Down mule. So the fact is, is that you really, though you do have the beginnings of industry in the South, it's not to the level that uh, the new South spokesman desired. You know, this idea that we were going to, as Southerners, we were going to put our cotton, put the cotton kingdom in our past. Um, you know, King Cotton survived the war and expanded uh, the new acreages um, and the old cotton belts that existed prior to the war are going to be expanded as well, as we've learned into um, not only North Carolina, but also parts of South Carolina. And then sugar, of course, sugar. Uh, in Louisiana, 
uh, which really was one of the most hardest hit uh, crops by the Civil War. By the 1890s, you're going to see uh, that industry is going to rebound. Um, so sharecropping and tenant farming, this is what's going to replace slavery. You know, one of the major um, areas of anxiety amongst um, many in the South is the loss of the labor supply. What was going to happen to the labor um, with, the, with the death of slavery? And so what happens is that slavery is going to be replaced by a system that mimics slavery. Okay, and, and I'll, let me describe what, what sharecropping and tenant farming are. Um, and so in the first bullet, uh, kind of defines what share, what the sharecropper does. Um, this is someone who basically has nothing. They have nothing to offer the landowner. This is someone who's going to essentially live on the landowner's land. They're going to be renters. They don't own their own farm. They don't own their own land. They don't own their own tools. They do not own their own mules. Okay. The only thing the sharecropper has is his labor. Um, he has no property. He has nothing. And so what the sharecropper is going to do under this system is he's going to till the land in return for the supplies he needs to do the work and a share of the crop, which is generally about half the crop. Okay. So the tenant farmer, not hardly better, not hardly better off. Um, the tenant farmer is someone who has his own mule. They have their own tools. They have their own plow. They have their own line of credit at the country store. Okay. And because they already have their tools, because they have their own mule, and because they actually have some property, you know, they might get a larger share of the crop, uh, usually anywhere from three fourths to two thirds, um, or three, three fourths of the cash crop and then two thirds of the subsistence crop, which is mainly corn. And the corn is what they ate. Um, so these are very, very poor farmers. And, um, and, uh, you know, again, they still owe rent to the landowners, but the tenant farmer has, um, he's got more property, okay, in terms of uh, the mule and the plow and the tools that was necessary. Now, the sharecropping and the tenant, the tenant system was terribly inefficient. And, and really what made tenancy and sharecropping the absolute worst system is that no matter how hard or how little, the sharecropper worked, um, they lacked incentive to care for the land. In addition, the system bred a morbid suspicion on both sides and the folklore of the rural South was replete with stories of tenants who remained stubbornly shiftless and landlords who kept the books with crooked pencils. So it, it was a very crooked system, very corrupt system, very inefficient. Um, it, it did not really reward the sharecropper and the tenant farmer for the the hard work that they put in, you tend to think that the harder you work at something, the more you get out of it. Um, but it, it wasn't the case with sharecropping. The crop lien system was equally flawed. Uh, at best, it supplied credit where cash was scarce. Country merchants furnished supplies in return for liens or mortgages on farmers' crops. And to a few tenants and small farmers who seized a chance, credit offered a way out. But to most, it offered only a hopeless cycle of perennial debt. So let me show you an image. We're going to wait for it to come up. Let me get to it. So just while we're waiting for that to load, Essentially, well, okay, here we are. Hold on. No. Okay. Having a few issues here. Oh, here we go. Thank you for your patience. So really what the, these sharecroppers and these tenant farmers um, and, and those that those farmers that are trying to make it on the crop lean system is really what they're finding themselves. They, they're finding themselves in a 
in a cycle of perennial debt. You know, um, there we go. There we go. No, I've got a nice little image here. So let's find it. It's this cycle right here, this image. So really, it's economic slavery. I think that's a great way. It's a great way to describe um, is that it, it 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 bounds people to the land. And let me explain why. Here's the cycle. So let's just read through the cycle together. So really, sharecropping starts, tenant farming starts. When poor whites and freedmen have no jobs, they have no homes, they have, and they have no money to buy land. You know, so what are they to do? You know, and then you look at your landlords, these people who own the land, they don't have enough people to work the land. And, and they don't have any money to pay people to work. All right, so sharecropping is, is you've got people who it's kind of like what they call it symbiosis, where they kind of need each other. You know, it's it's a um, so this is what happens. They hire poor whites and freedmen as laborers. They sign contracts to work the landlord's land in exchange for a part of the crop. The landlord keeps track of the money that the sharecroppers owe in terms of housing, rent, food, or their credit line at the local store. If they're if they take out credit at the local store, because you know at the at the local store, you know these sharecroppers are going to need seed. They're going to need fertilizer. Uh, they might actually need livestock or mules or, um, but they're going to need supplies, right? So they, 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 that's that crop lean system. The crop lean system is that these, these farmers get caught up in uh, getting this line of credit, you know? And, and so what happens then is that at harvest time, their sharecropper gets paid, um, pays off his debts, and if the sharecropper owes more, and this is the case right here, guys, this is the case. If the sharecropper owes more to the landlord or store than his share of the crop is worth, then number six, the sharecropper cannot leave the farm as long as he's in debt to the landlord. So it just seemed like every planting cycle, these sharecroppers found themselves deeper and deeper in debt to their landlords. And, and it served the landlord well to keep these um, poor tenant farmers and sharecroppers, uh, it served them well to um, keep them bound to the land, you know, to keep them from leaving. Because it helps, for them, it helps um, sustain a stable labor supply, okay? So our next topic, um, Moving along pretty well here. It's a nice little image. By the way, don't get in your mind that actually most tenants and sharecroppers were whites. And we're talking about the poorest people in the South were sharecroppers. And the majority of the sharecroppers were white. So don't, don't have in your mind this image that all of these poor sharecroppers were black. African American that they they weren't uh, the majority were white. So then we had the Bourbon Redeemers. Uh, this is a no card term. This basically is a group of men um, in the South who are essentially going to dominate Southern politics after the war. Like one Union officer noted, he said, "Quote: Every community had its great man or its little great man." around whom his fellow citizens gather when they want information and to whose monologues they listen with a respect akin to humility. So after the reconstruction, Southern politics was dominated by groups of these of, of such men known, collect, known in history as the Bourbons. Okay, so prior to the Civil War, we refer to these guys as, we refer to these gentlemen as the, um, the planters, right? The planter class. That they were the they were the men that dominated the political life, uh, the economic life of the South. Well, it's not the planters anymore. I mean, the Civil War destroyed that. So these Bourbon Redeemers are the elites that are going to fill their shoes, the planters' shoes. So, like, so where does the term Bourbon Redeemers 
That's, that seems like a really obscure thing to call a group of people. So um, it's really it's really interesting, and I, and I wanted to include it uh, in this lecture uh, and on this PowerPoint because I, I think it's a, it's fascinating where the term can, comes from. So like the French bourbons, so the, the word bourbon uh, actually refers to the French royal family, um, which Napoleon said, forgot nothing and learned nothing in the ordeal of the French Revolution. So likely, so to compare them to the Southern planters or the Southern elites, the Southern bourbons were said to have forgotten nothing and learned nothing in the ordeal of the Civil War. So just read that a couple of times, and I think it'll sit in that that uh, the the Southern elites um, were a lot like the the bourbons that emerged after the French Revolution, you know. And so the word function, so the word means many things. Uh, at, at first, it was used by Republicans as a hateful epithet, you know. Um, Republican, independent, and populist adversaries fixed the label bourbon so firmly in the vocabulary of the times that the word bourbon came to mean leaders of the Democratic Party. So who were the bourbon redeemers? They were. They, it was a label given to leaders of the Democratic Party uh, in the South. Whether they were real throwbacks or commonly champions of an industrial new South, who if they forgot nothing, had at least learned something. <laughs> they may have, and this is another descriptor. Um, what is the word, who are the Bourbons? They are men who worshiped at the altar of the old order, but they embraced a new order or economic development. So, so these were guys who worshiped at the altar of the old order. So you gotta think, at, ask yourself, what is the old order? What is it that they worship? What is it that they wanted to maintain? Right? So for me, I would say white supremacy, um, pre-Civil War race relations, um, you know, this idea of keeping blacks, you know, in their place to deprive blacks of their equality and their voting rights. So, so the old order, I think, uh, is maintaining as much of the old South uh, in terms of race and social social class and social order. But they embraced a new order when it came to economic development, which we've talked about with the New South Creed. They formed a political alliance with Eastern conservatives and an economic alliance with Eastern capitalists. They pushed a policy of laissez-faire, which consists of low taxes, debt reduction, and low government regulation of the economy. So. They embrace capitalism, um, but despite their reputation for honesty, these bourbons, these elites, tended to be very corrupt. They were often caught with their hands in the public treasury. And though they were dedicated to the New South Creed, they were unwilling to make investments necessary, including education. And you remember I, I included that. That was a big, big part of Henry, du uh, Henry W. Grady's speech is the importance of bringing a, um, a very effective education system to the South. As you can see by uh, the stats given, the further we get away from the reconstruction, the less these bourbons spent per pupil. And the result is by the time we get to 1890, Literacy rate for whites is 88. Literacy rates for blacks, 50%. So um, even the schools that were built were not equal in caliber um, when it comes to race. Uh, I got a typo here. So one educational leader summarized conditions at the turn of the century, quote, in the Southern states, in schoolhouses costing an average of 276 each, under teachers receiving an average salary of $25 a month, we are giving children an actual attendance only five cents worth of education a day for 87 days only in a year. Imagine going to school for 87 days. Huh. I mean, that's, that's like three months. It's like three months. Another attribute 
probably one of the, the most shameful institutions brought to the New South is the convict leasing system. Uh, the Bourbons created a penal system that served as one of the worst blots on their record. Prisons in the South sent out to work on cotton and sugar farms during the New South. Uh, the, uh, the prisoners uh, sent out prisoners to work and, and in doing so recreated slave labor. So, so again, one of the great anxieties that Southern elites had after the Civil War was what are we going to do for labor? What are we going to do? How are we going to get workers for the fields? And, uh, and, and of course, not just the fields, but, you know, the, the railroads that we build, the, the, the coal mines we have, you know, who, where can we go for cheap labor? And so what, what filled this desire was what, you know, the convict leasing system. Prisoners became the cheap labor. Punishments and arrests were considered petty. There was a concerted effort to grow the prison population. The larger the prison population, the more labor you have. So now you are arresting people of color for essentially very petty crimes. And, and by the way, not even a lot of these young men didn't even commit any crimes. Um, because, so yeah, so the state used the convict leasing to generate a mass amount of revenue and, and um, amongst the prisoners, ages varied and, and white black prisoners were segregated. And there were children, children that were even used. I mean, you look at this picture here, and and, and you could actually get online, and you can you can you could find libraries full of these pictures. But I mean, this young man here, he can't be any more than your age. You know, look at look at. Him. I mean, these are young people um, who were used. So, and these were chain gangs. You can see how they're chained together. They wear the stripes. You know. Eighteen seventy, there were eight hundred and forty blacks in prison. Now, let's talk about Texas. I know a little something about Texas. I have some some pretty amazing um, statistics uh, when it comes to uh, the the convict leasing system in Texas. I and what I actually attended a a um, uh, a lecture um, at Rice University. There was a professor there that did a whole three hour lecture on the convict leasing system in Texas. So I was able to take a few notes and I wanna share that with you. It's, it's really shocking. In 1870, there were 840 blacks total in Texas prisons. And that made up 30% of the prison population. 30 years later, the number grew to 4,000 blacks in prison, which constituted 40% of the total prison population. So what you find is over time, more and more people of color are being arrested, going to prison for doing petty things, um, that, the, that by growing the prison population, you're also growing the number of labor, the amount of labor that is available. Um, and, and essentially what happens is, let's just say that you own a sugar farm, then what you do is you go to the state of Texas and you ask the state of Texas if you could lease 10 prisoners, 10 convicts, or maybe 100 convicts to come work on your sugar farm. And so you would pay the state of Texas um, money to lease these prisoners to work on your job sites. And so the state of Texas, therefore, had an incentive um, to try to increase the black population in prisons, because the more blacks they had in prison, then the more money they would make from the leasing. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it, it's pretty it's pretty shady. Uh, the Walls Prison, which is in Huntsville, uh, they actually had a textile mill inside the prison where the whites worked and the blacks worked outside. You know, so the Walls Prison, uh, by the way, I don't know if y'all know this, but in Huntsville, that's where death row is. That's where the original uh, death row is. Uh, I think that's where they still uh, execute people in the walls unit. It's right there next to uh, San Houston State University, like literally right across the street. Uh, the system allowed the states to avoid expenses, and maybe even bring profits 
The system was also a byproduct of a demand for cheap labor. So I included uh, a couple of documents here. If this has really gotten your interest, um, this really this first one, the story out of Texas Monthly, uh, kind of gives you a, a good overview of the history of the convict leasing system in Texas. Um, but just know that, you know, eventually um, it became very well um, apparent to um, the bureaucracy in the state government that there were all kinds of injustice. Justice is being carried out within the prison. Uh, torture, whippings, um, the women, the, the women that were um, incarcerated, but all, you know, were often raped and I mean, just brutally, brutally treated. Um, and, and usually these are men and women who are being arrested on bogus charges. So, I mean, there's evidence of there being eight year olds, elderly men. I mean, there was one African-American you see down here at the bottom, got five years, five years for stealing an orange. So, so it's, yeah, it's no good, it's no good. Southern states, uh, began to explore leasing on a more broader scope, but they really didn't know if it was legal. But then we had the Supreme Court case, Ruffin versus the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, and it happened where a convict on a chain gang, he gets in a fight, he kills a man, and he's sentenced to death. And he made the argument that the prison can't try him. And, and only the county where the offense took place can try him. And the Virginia Supreme Court ruled no. And this is the quote that comes out of the, the court ruling. He is, for the time being, the slave of the state. Now, class, remember, this is, this is a loophole. Uh, the convict leasing system is a loophole uh, around the 13th Amendment. I mean, so these, these, the convict leasing system, um, kind of like in, in its own unique way, kind of like the sharecropping, it does relegate people of color into a form of slavery, um, a form of slavery. So this court case became, becomes the precedent to broaden the leasing program into other states like Texas. And Texas, of course, adopted, adopted this uh, ruling to justify its convict leasing system. And interestingly enough, one of the largest sugar plantations in the United States was located near present day Houston in a place we know as Sugarland, Sugarland, Texas. And Imperial Sugar is the name of that company. Imperial Sugar. And Imperial Sugar used convict labor. In fact, it had thousands of workers. Convict labor, right there in Sugarland. So, and like I said, it, what these convicts were not just used in the fields, they were also used in the mines in Alabama. So the Bourbon Redeemers, they're the ones um, who overthrew the Reconstruction carpetbagger scalawag governments. They're the ones that got rid of the Republicans. They're the ones that decried Republican rule with the expression rule or ruin. You know, the idea that if the Democrats aren't allowed to rule the South, then the Republicans are going to leave the South into ruin. You know, so the bourbon redeemers, I think we looked at the name of the word or the meaning of the word bourbon, but let's also remember what the word redeemer means. You know, to redeem means to make whole again, you know, to make right again, to make things, you know, to to reestablish. So so the bourbon redeemers, they see themselves as bringing the South back. Um, they want to be different when it comes to their economics but they want to remain the same when it comes to their social practices, especially when it comes to race. And, and really what they decried, um, what was so bad about the Republicans? What was it about the Republicans that caused the, these, these Southern Democrats, these redeemers to cry rule or ruin. And it's the black citizenship. And, and with that, voting rights. The voting rights was, was something that, that was really escalated things. And this is a Southern perspective. Uh, you can see down here, it's, uh, it says a Southern legislature in the carpetbagger days. 
saying, you know, when you give African Americans self government, this is what you get debauchery, mayhem, you know, law, you know, just disorder. Uh, they can't be trusted with a vote. They cannot be trusted with power. I mean, this is their, their point of view. We all know it's not correct. This image, by the way, was actually located. Uh, this was actually on the AP exam a couple of years ago. This is one of the short answer questions. And so, um, so obviously on the left, um, you can see this is the Reconstruction government, 1869 to 1777. Remember, 1877 is the year that Reconstruction comes to an end. And so you got the, 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 this is the representative of the New South who's carrying the burden of these carpetbag governments, these Republican governments, in which, um, you know, the South is being ruled by the, by the military, by the Union Army, you know, in, in many cases with, with uh, the imposition of martial law. Here you got the rule or ruin, um, right here. Yeah, rule or ruin. Um, I have to go back and I have to look. Uh, I've got a key for this. I'm trying to remember what this is. I think this is like the halls of justice. And you can see that you got burned out buildings, you got sinking ships, you know, that under Republican carpetbag governments, the South is in uh, disorder, um, that there's a heavy burden that the South is having to color, cover, and that if you just simply leave the South alone, which is right here, 1877-1881, you know, this is um, President uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, you know, he's the guy who's going to give, he's going to end Reconstruction. Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, publicly said that um, it's time to let them alone, right? We got to let the South alone. We got to turn the South over. And, uh, and so you've got um, Rutherford B. Hayes, who's embracing Southern rule, um, that the South has learned their lesson, that they're going to do okay when it comes to race policy. But under Democrat rule, um, once you get rid of the Republican carpetbag governments, you can see a, a healthy northern con or southern economy. They're loading bales of cotton onto, onto ships. You got factories belching coal dust into the sky. You know, so you got you know thriving ships um, on the rivers. You know, so um, you got people working in the fields. You know, so everything's all happy. So this is a a kind of a side by side before and after. Um, Race, it's not about race. This is big. Um, almost done. Um, the old slave owner um, said a South Carolina editor, quote, has no desire to browbeat, maltreat, and spit upon the colored man. Clearly in part because the former slave owner posed no threat to his status. So at the end of the war, many Southerners believed that they were actually doing right by the colored man, that they're doing right by the African-American. And and they really didn't feel like the, the African-American was suffering. Um, but that wasn't the truth. I mean, in, in a certain degree, you know, if you look at this first bullet here, it says black sat in state legislatures, South Carolina until 1900 and Georgia until 1908. Some black representatives were also Democrats. They weren't all Republicans. The South actually sent uh, black congressmen to Washington in every election all the way to 1901 or 1900, except one. And though they they always represented gerrymandered districts into which most of the state's black voters have been thrown. So what, what the Bourbons were able to do is they were able to draw congressional districts in a way, in a manner in which um, you would have a majority black population. So when you have a majority black population, they're going to elect a black congressman. But then by creating these all black districts, uh, they made the rest of the districts white. So even though blacks were given one congressman, you know, um, whites were able to send the rest of their congressmen, uh, the rest of the districts were able to um, 
said white congressman. Segregation emergence, separation of the races emerged slightly before reconstruction ended. And we, we first see it in schools, churches, hotels, and rooming houses and private social relations. In places of public accommodation, such as trains, depots, theaters, and soda fountains, discrimination was more sudden, sudden and random. In 1885, I like this, this anecdote here. In 1885, a black journalist reported from his native state of South Carolina that he rode first class cars on the railroads and in the streets, was served at saloons and soda fountains, saw Negroes dining with whites at train stations, and saw a black policeman arrest a white man on the streets of Columbia. This was in 1885. However, 15 years later, such scenes would be rare. So what caused the attitudes to change? Okay, so if in the 1880s, there wasn't as much segregation and racial discrimination. What caused things to change? And there's two major causes. Number one, many whites embraced a radical racism that held that blacks um, loosed from bondage, loosed, you know, freed from slavery, were retrogressing towards bestiality, especially the younger blacks. That, that now that uh, freedmen are free, they don't know how to exercise their freedom. Two, political. The rise of the Populist Party in the 1890s divided the white vote to such an extent that in some places, the black vote became the balance of power. I want you to think about that. Populists courted black votes, brought blacks prominently into their councils, and in short, prevented black domination. So the Burmans, the Bourbon response was to revive the race issue, which they exploited with finesse. And despite the 15th Amendment, states used poll taxes, literacy tests, even though many objected to them on the basis that they denied poor whites from voting. But the state that led the way in disenfranchising, that means taking away the vote, African-Americans was Mississippi. And eventually other states are going to follow Mississippi's model. Mississippi, by the way, guys, is essentially, um, you know, really from this moment on, they're ground zero when it comes to disenfranchising blacks. Uh, they have one of the, if not the worst record when it comes to race and segregation um, as a state. And, and really, it, Mississippi served as a model for the other southern states to emulate. In the copy. So, for example, in 1896, Louisiana had 130,000 registered black voters. In four years, they only had 5,000, just over 5,000. Alabama, 1900, had 121,000 literate Negro males over the age of 21, but all, just over 3,700 were registered to vote. Ultimately, if a black was able to overcome all barriers put in his way, most states just simply refused to count the votes. Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow followed the efforts to disenfranchise black voters. Jim Crow was done on the local and state by state basis, on the local level and on a state by state basis. From 1875 to 1883, any racial segregation and it violated a federal Civil Rights Act of 1875, which forbade discrimination in places of a public accommodation. So what I did here um, is I gave you links uh, to five court cases, okay, uh, five court cases. And so for the purposes of the exam and for the AP test, um, there's actually three of these that I would say are more important than the other two. A slaughterhouse, number one, that's in 1875. Um, Cruikshank's pretty important. It had to do with the, uh, um, oh my goodness. I have to come back to that. There was a massacre. Um, anyway, Strotter versus West Virginia, that, that's the case about 
uh, juries. Um, an African American sued that he was uh, convicted by an all white jury. He wanted to have an all black jury, and Supreme Court ruled that you don't need an all black jury. You know, so um, so that's a really bad case. So you could read that case brief. Uh, it's very interesting. It gives uh, these case briefs, by the way, uh, kind of give the background behind the case, and then it gives you. Um, the basic ruling. Uh, the civil rights cases are very important. I introduced the civil rights cases during the Reconstruction period. And of course, I think the, the one most Americans know is Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, I gave you that case brief as well. That's the separate but equal case in which the Supreme Court ruled that, that um, segregation <clears throat> is constitutional as long as the two facilities, the two facilities that are being um, segregated had to be equal in caliber. So going back to that Civil Rights Act uh, enacted in March of 1879, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 affirmed, quote, the equality of all men before the law. It prohibited racial discrimination in public places, in facilities such as restaurants and public transportation. The law also made it a crime for anyone to facilitate the denial of such accommodations or services on the basis of color, race, or previous condition of servitude, if they're a former slave or not. All lawsuits arising under the Civil Rights Act were to be tried in federal courts rather than state courts. And, and so ultimately, uh, those cases we're talking about before, the civil rights cases, um, to a certain extent, uh, Cruikshank and Slaughterhouse, they ruled that um, that um, the 14th, 13th and 14th amendments only apply to the federal government and not to states. So state governments can completely segregate. They can completely deny African-Americans. They can discriminate racially in public places. The federal, that, and that really the, the 13th and 14th amendments only apply to the federal government, and um, and and that um, also, and this is the uh, the civil rights cases of 1883 ruled that um, the Civil Rights Act does not apply to individual action. It doesn't apply to individuals. So if you're a a restaurant owner in Jackson, Mississippi, um, civil rights laws don't apply to individuals like you. So you can you can keep people of color from eating in your restaurant because it uh, the civil rights laws do not apply to individuals. It only applies to state governments or to the federal government, excuse me. So last topic. So what's going on, you know, with the the new south, you you have two men are going to emerge. Uh, they become rivals with each other. Uh, they don't see eye to eye. Uh, these are two black leaders, um, two very famous black leaders. Uh, the first is Booker T. Washington, an educator reformer, arguably the most influential black leader of his time. He he preached, and I, I really take note here, he preached a philosophy of self-help, racial solidarity, and accommodation. He believed that, talking about self-help, he he said that, you know, we, blacks have to learn to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. They got to they gotta come to the realization that, um, the only person that can help them is themselves. Um, he urged blacks to accept discrimination for the time being. That's what accommodation means. You need to accept it. You know, uh, African Americans, we could thrive. The Irish did it. He uses the Irish model. You know, at first, the Irish were discriminated against, but eventually, the Irish are going to be accepted. And so he says that. Um, what African Americans should do is concentrate on elevating themselves through hard work and material prosperity. Okay. So how is it that the freedmen and the children of freedmen, how can they rise in a segregated Southern society? And so he believed Booker T. Washington believed in um, uh, vocational training. Learning, learning a skill, industrial or farming skills, cultivation of virtues of patience, enterprise, and thrift. 
This, he said, would win the respect of whites and lead to African Americans being fully accepted as citizens and integrated into all areas. Counter, and of course, I'm going to tell you, these guys did not like each other at all. W.B. Du Bois, a towering black intellectual, scholar, political thinker, said no, Washington's strategy would only perpetuate white oppression. Uh, he's very militant. He's, he's very militant. He, he believes that Booker T. Washington is a leader of the black race only in the eyes of white people. Uh, du Bois advocated political action and a civil rights agenda. It was W.B. Du Bois, by the way, who, along with other white uh, civil rights leaders, uh, founded the NAACP, um, which is today, uh, it's, one of the, it's one of the oldest, uh, one of the most distinguished uh, civil rights organizations in the United States. In addition, he argued social change could be accomplished by developing a small group of college-educated blacks he called the talented tenth. And so uh, he felt like that we should cultivate a small group of black elites, uh, college-educated black elites that would help lift the Negro race up. He says, quote, the Negro race, like all races, is going to be saved by its exceptional men. The problem of education then among Negroes first must of all must first of all deal with the talented tenth. It is the problem of developing the best of this race that they may guide the mass away from. Oh boy. Let's see. They may guide the mass away from the contamination and death of the worst. So his big emphasis was on education and the, the key to advancement uh, for African Americans is education through the talented tenth by cultivating a group of black leaders. Um, I put some uh, links to some of their um, uh, addresses, you know, some of their speeches. I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with these. I did put a couple of these on your on your outside reading list, so you can come here. Uh, and, and you can access those uh, documents here. And so last but not least, this actually is the last uh, topic. This is the, old, the, the lost cause. Um, you know, coming out of the Civil War, the South really stiffened their resistance to complying with the laws of Reconstruction, in large part because they believed in, in what was called the lost cause. Um, it's a myth. Um, that the set of myths uh, that they created um, to help explain uh, the Civil War. Okay, so what I did is I included a link um, to the power to um, a, a lost cause PowerPoint, and, it, and it's really thorough. It's really good. I'm going to skip that, but it, it might be uh, a good use for you to um, go to my Google site. Uh, download this, uh, power, upload this PowerPoint, and then come to the slide and click this link. Uh, but I want to look at the, the six tenets of the lost cause, okay? And, and these were six myths that were created um, in which the South, um, you know, what is a myth? I mean, a myth is something you make up to help explain why things are the way they are, okay? So I don't know why my computer is so slow today. Okay. So it was actually, you can get into the origins of the lost cause. It actually began with uh, Southern women uh, who be some of the, the, the first, um, um, some of the first actual historians who were going to write about the Civil War is, um, were women. You know, the daughters, I think it was what the daughters of the, uh, uh, Confederacy, the Daughters of the Confederacy, or was a group that actually is going to help keep not only create these myths, but uh, perpetuate these myths even today. I mean, you still have pockets of people in the South today who believe in these myths. So this says here in the article, it says there are six main parts of the lost cause myth. Uh, the first and most important myth is that secession not slavery was the cause of the Civil War. Now, there isn't a historian, an American historian alive that believes this. 
right? So really what the South does after the war is they want to make the, the, the war about everything except slavery. It had nothing to do with slavery. It says, you know, they, they, they believe that slave, Southern states seceded to protect their rights, their homes, to throw off the shackles of tyrannical government. To the proponents of the lost cause, secession was constitutional, and the Confederacy was their natural heir to the American Revolution. Because secession was constitutional, all those who fought for the Confederacy were not traitors. Northerners, specifically Northern abolitionists, caused the war. South didn't cause the war. The abolitionists caused the war with their fiery rhetoric and agitating. And even though slavery was on its way to gradually dying a natural death. So they actually believe that, that this, these abolitionists were to blame for the war in a time in which slavery was actually dying. And we know it wasn't dying. You know, they also argued secession was a way to preserve the Southern agrarian way of life in the face of encroaching Northern industrialism. The second tenet is this idea that slavery was portrayed as a positive good, you know? So um, again, they're trying to influence the writing of history here. They want to make it sound like slavery really wasn't that bad. Enslaved people who were submissive, happy, and faithful to their masters were better off in slavery, which offered the slaves protection, right? So Confederate Vice President, we read this document, um, Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens declared in 1861, quote, our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. So Alexander Stevens actually negates the whole, you know, this whole myth. This is that, by the way, the cornerstone address uh, that we've read. Following the end of the war, these formerly enslaved people were now said to be unprepared for freedom, which was the argument against Reconstruction in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The third tenet states that the Confederacy was only defeated because of the Northern states' numerical advantage in men and resources. So the big thing is, and I want to stress this, is they believe they didn't lose. They didn't lose the war. Their cause was just. Their cause was just. They didn't lose the war. They just simply ran out of men and resources. Fourth, Confederate soldiers are portrayed as heroic, gallant, and saintly. Even after the surrender, they retained their honor. And at one reunion oration, Confederate General Thomas Cobb who was killed at the Battle of Fredericksburg, was compared to Joshua. In his courage, St. Paul and the logic of his eloquence, and St. Stephen and the triumph of his martyrdom. So this religious, you know, they're, they're, they're compared to the martyrs. Um, fifth, Robert E. Lee emerged as the most sanctified figure in lost cause lore, especially after his death in 1870. He was seen, he became known, he became the symbol for the lost cause. A cult of Lee revered the Virginian as the ultimate Christian warrior who took up arms for his state and was even called the second George Washington. And he, not far behind Lee was Stonewall Jackson. Um, and, and, and so what we find throughout the, the rest of this, the next 100 years is you see the erecting right here. This is a great example, the erecting of statues, the erecting of, of statues to Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and Jefferson Davis as affirmation of the lost cause. And, and really what it was is, is it becomes a big, giant, um, you know, uh, I like to say a, a big, giant uh, kick in the butt <laughs> to... Um, the North, you know, that every, really, by the way, these monuments, I actually have a link on my website uh, on the homepage down at the bottom um, about the Confederate monument issue and why they were erected. And they were largely re erected as reminders to African-Americans really what the war was and what the war was about. And they're, yeah, so it's a reminder of a fake past. Uh, and then finally, Finally, tenant number six, Southern women also steadfastly supported the cause. 
sacrificing their men, time, and resources more than their northern counterparts. The idealized image of a pure, saintly, white southern woman emerged as well. So the idea of the southern bell, right? The southern women played a larger role. Southern women played a larger role in spreading the lost cause. Um, women were seen as inherently non-political. Memorializing was not seen as political. They were able to take the lead in memorializing and mythologizing, mythologizing the Southern cause. So, and really, you know, that's that's what we're trying to tear down today. You know, I, I at the end of the day, I don't like the manner in which we're, you know, in the nastiness and tearing down these, you know, these statues. But, um, I mean, we are, as historians, we're, we're trying to set the record straight. Um, and that these myths that have been created about the Civil War, that the Southerners really buy into. And, and you see it in their, in their history books um, that they write. Um, um, they're writing things that isn't true. Okay. So, anyway, so I'm going to stop our... Um, yeah, this ends. This is the end of it. Thanks for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure you reach out to me. Thank you.